All right, well, welcome, Village Church. Glad you are watching this from all around the world, especially in our home country of Canada, of course. Hopefully, you guys are doing well. Um, this is week two of the Gospel of John. So if you have a Bible, please open it. John chapter one. And this, as we said last week, is what's called the prologue. So we're gonna, this is the first 18 verses where John introduces us to his biggest themes. Then we're gonna take uh, a break for uh, three Sundays and Christmas Eve and do our Advent series, which we're super excited about, exploring hope and peace and love and joy in a very special way. And then uh, we'll be coming back in the new year and kicking off a full uh, series on the Gospel of John. And so hopefully um, as we work through this, this book as, is as exciting to you as it is for me as I said last week, if there was one book, if it became illegal um, in my lifetime to only have one biblical book, what would it be? It would be the Gospel of John, clearly, because it not only kind of tells the story about Jesus, it kind of gets into like what it all means, which, which I love and I think is going to be super helpful for you, whether you're a Christian yet or not, which brings us to the theme of what we're going to talk about today, because we've been introduced to Jesus as the word. And John told us last week in the beginning was the word, the word was God. And then he starts to explain that who this word was, that the word is Jesus. And now just before he gets into unpacking what that looks like in detail, he pivots for a second and he explains to us uh, about this man called John. And it's a different John than the writer. It's John the Baptist. And he uses him, and I'm going to talk about him as an example of discipleship for you and me, because the Bible talks about John as the greatest man who ever lived. And so we got to ask the question, does he have stuff in his life that actually is, is, is super important for us as we try to follow Jesus in the world? So this is how John jumps into it. He says, uh, he's explained to us in the beginning was the word and so on. And now he starts this. He says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And so he begins by kind of getting, you know, he's talked about Jesus and now almost out of nowhere. Like uh, this week I've started introducing my daughters to Lord of the Rings, the movies. And so we've been watching them kind of in order and they watch the Fellowship of the Ring and they've kind of been introduced to all the wizards and the dwarves and the, all this stuff. And now we're in, we went to number two, the two towers. And all of a sudden it turns and there's this whole group called Rohan. And they're like, who's Rohan? I thought I was already introduced to all the main characters. And now we got a new character seemingly coming out of nowhere. What is this about? Who is this John guy? And this is what we got to understand about who John is. Every, it's not actually out of nowhere. Every gospel, all four gospels start their story about Jesus by talking about John. John the Baptist. This is a different John than the writer John. It's John the Baptist. And the reason they start with him is very important. It's because they were living in a time, historically, when basically the way the Jews thought was there was the present age and then there was the age to come. So in the present age, there was evil, there was destruction, Israel was in exile, Satan was on the loose, sin was having its day. But one day in the age to come, God would show up and he would, he would redeem people. He would kill Satan and destroy him. He would destroy sin and death and redeem everything and bring joy and peace. That was in the age to come. And the first sign that the age to come was actually happening was the arrival of John or somebody like John, we find out later, it was actually to them, somebody who is very much like Elijah. So the entire Old Testament ends in the book of Malachi or Malachi, the Italian prophet, <laughs> that's the Italians would say. And it, the, the book, all the Old Testament ends with these words, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land of the decree of utter destruction. That's Malachi chapter four. And then the Old Testament ends and there's 400 years of silence waiting for this Elijah figure to show up before the Messiah shows up. So it's like, like literally even Jews today at certain meals will set the table and they'll put a chair out waiting for Elijah to show up. Because when Elijah shows up for dinner, that means the Messiah has actually arrived and he's, and he's blazing the pathway, getting everything ready for this great moment where the Lord shows back up to the world. So this is a huge moment in the sense that John is literally saying that this figure, this Elijah figure has actually arrived. All right. So he says there was a man sent and then, and then there's this great phrase sent from God. It's like, 
he, what's fascinating, what's beautiful about this phrase to me is that God would even want to send us stuff. Like we're a gong show. Look at how beautiful. There's a man sent from God. Like this is, this is caring. This is even though you're sinful, even though you're a disaster, all right? Even though that you're a narcissist turned in on yourself, even though you think every day, almost exclusively, what's going to be good for you, God still sends You know, beautiful, like I wake up every morning, you know, the first thing I do, I reach for my phone and I scroll email and I check what's going on in the world. I don't go right to my knees and pray and open my Bible right away and dig in and say, Lord, 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 and still he doesn't kill me. Still, he doesn't just hit my life with a bunch of affliction in order to draw my, this is how good he is. This is how gracious he is. This is what, this is like the prodigal son story where the son goes off and does a bunch of evil, terrible things. And yet when he turns back, the father actually runs out to him and embraces him. This is what we get in Christianity is this idea that God sends, even though we're not worthy of him sending. And then Scholars also point out the fact that there was this whole community of people that thought John the Baptist was, was like divine, like they followed him, all right? They thought he was the man. They thought he was like, he was the celebrity pastor of the first century. He, he had the most Instagram followers. He, was, he would hang out with all the celebrities. He was the best. He was legit. Everyone loved him. And right off the bat, the writer John wants to tell us he isn't actually the one. He's a pointer to the one. This is John sent from God. And this is why he goes on. He says, if you scan down your Bibles to uh, verse 19, he comes back to John. He says, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So John wants right off the bat, let's make sure we're clear on who this is. This is not the divine one. This is not the one you're supposed to build your life on. I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then, are you Elijah? And he he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees and they asked him, then why are you baptizing? If you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet, John answered, I baptize you with water. But among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. You see what John's doing? He's telling us that this prophet is not the one everyone's supposed to follow. He's a pointer to the one everyone's supposed to follow. This is... This is him trying to make sure that we have the right guy that we're worshiping. This is like if you started to make the mistake and make your faith about me or make your faith about village church or make your, that I'm about this team and I'm about that team. He's going, no, 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 you don't understand. This isn't about what church you go to and what thing you're about, what celebrities you're a part. This is about Jesus. Your life, your faith is to be informed, not by leaders, not by brands, not by who, it's, it's Jesus and Jesus alone. This week, we had a uh, news or a couple weeks ago of a celebrity pastor that a lot of people knew and followed and celebrated. This is who John, it's like invited to all the conferences, writing of the books. This is who John the Baptist was. And this celebrity, he fell. He admitted to having an affair in his marriage and there's, there's different reports coming out about it. And, and, and I've seen people online saying, I'm going to deny Christianity because of this. I don't want to follow Christianity anymore because this is yet another pastor, another leader. And there's, there's so much hypocrisy in the church. I don't want to follow Jesus anymore. And this is the lesson of John the Baptist. It's saying, you got to make your faith about the right person. Your faith isn't about a leader. Your faith is focused on Jesus who will never let you down, who will never fail, who will never cheat on his wife, who will never let it go to his head, who will never let his ego destroy him. That's who your faith is. And this is why one writer has said, don't look at the church and then judge Christianity. Look at the one behind the church because I could be walking along a pathway and I could point you in the right direction if you're looking for a house. But if I'm walking along it drunkenly, it doesn't mean that path isn't the right way. It just means I'm a gong show. It means I'm a drunk. It means I can't figure my life out. But that doesn't mean it's not the right path. And so what, what John, the writer, is trying to get us to do is focus on the right person, which is why in Acts 19, 
when the apostle Paul comes up to some people, they're like, hey, he goes, who do you follow? And they go, we've got John the Baptist baptism. And he's like, no, 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 you need the, your focus on Jesus baptism. And they're like, what? We've never heard of this Jesus before because they were all amped up on John the Baptist. And so some of you right now, you're like, I have Village Church or I'm a, I'm a Mark Clark guy or I'm a, I'm a John MacArthur guy or I'm a Beth Moore person, I'm a whatever. Listen, that's not what it's about. It's about Jesus. Over and over and over again, this gospel is gonna try to get us to think about the right kinds of things. Now, here's, here's a second thing. I think we can extract from John the Baptist's life uh, as John introduces him here for our life as disciples. What we see is that humility is what defines faith, right? John, right off the bat is saying, uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light. He, he's a witness, but he's not the actual light himself. And in, uh, down a little bit in verse eight, he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Later in that story, he says, I'm a voice. Now picture that for a second. I'm a voice. I'm just a voice. I'm not even the thing, right? If you hear a siren on an ambulance, that siren's just going off, but it's going to the thing. It's, point, it's going somewhere. And John's going, this is why later in John chapter three, he says, he must increase and I must decrease because Listen, the universe isn't about me. That's what he's trying to say. The universe isn't about you. The universe isn't about you and your comfort and your family and your security and your reputation. The universe is about God and his family and his reputation being felt in the world. That's the point. Uh, later on, it's gonna say in verse 14, we beheld his glory. You know what the word glory means? It means weight. And the concept of the weight of God, the, 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 uh, uh, glory was literally a word where you'd have water and you have a rock fall off a cliff and go into the water. And if the glory or the weight of that rock was bigger than the water, then the water would explode. See, it's, it's about feeling the glory of God versus the glory of ourselves in the world. What does the world around you feel? Your glory, your influence, your weight, or the weight of Jesus? That is the definitive question of humility. It's what this text is raising up for us. There was a... Um, film crew recently that came and they, they wanted to talk about why Village Church has been so successful. And they're like, come on, give us the clues. Give us the keys. Give us the magic, the secret sauce. I'm like, yeah, I got some secret sauce. I have no idea. I don't even know what I'm doing. This was God's work, not my work from beginning to end. I can't even, I don't even know how to play Settlers of Catan properly. All right? I don't even know how to set my cable television up properly to my television, which I tried for an hour yesterday because I couldn't have my wife's help, right? You don't want to base your faith on me, man. You want to base your faith on Jesus. This is what he's trying to say. Even the symbol that John the Baptist has given, baptism. You know what the symbol of baptism, it, it, the definition of the symbol of baptism is? It's uncool, right? It's, there's no way to be cool in baptism. I remember when I got baptized, I... Uh, I had this big, like, like big, they put me in a big white, um, uh, like, like choir robe and they kind of marched me up in front of the whole church. And I was like 19, I was like, put my cigarette out, kind of walk in from the back and I'm standing there in my big choir robe. I'm like, I love Jesus. They're like, oh, and they baptize you and there's snot coming down your nose. You're all wet. And like, there's no way to be cool in baptism, but that's the point. Being cool ain't the point. Your glory, your weight, this is all about humility. I'm just a voice. I'm nobody telling everybody about somebody, as one writer has said. A big S somebody, Jesus himself. You know, there's certain things that keep me humble in life because it's a fight to keep humble in all of our lives. One of them is reading your comments on the internet, you know, it's fantastic because it never lets me, I, I, I'm recently, there was a, uh, you know, Village Church plays on Facebook live and then people make comments. And, and recently there was this great comment uh, by a lady. Uh, she said uh, about my sermon, I don't understand why he talks like he does. It's terrible to listen to. <laughs> Thanks lady. All right, so it's like, you know, all I need to do to stay humble is listen to you. 
right? Because this is what God wants to say. I just keep that on my phone all the time. Anybody say, oh, Mark, I just go on. Why does he talk like that? It's terrible to listen to. This is what we all need in our life. We need a little bit of the, the and this is what John's trying to say. Look at what he says in, in 22. I'm, I'm the voice uh, down in 27. I love this. I'm not worthy. We need a little Wayne's world in our life, right? I'm not worthy. <laughs> All right. That's a little, uh, if you shoot to the nineties for the kids who have no idea what I'm talking about, we're not worthy. There's, we need a little bit of that in our life. When I showed up at, um, up at uh, church for the first time, I was the uh, chain smoking, baggy pants. You know, I actually, the first time I ever went to church, I got in a fight with a guy. I was literally in youth group and I was like, what the F, bro? And he's like, no, you what the F? And we started scrapping out. I didn't end up going back for a little while. But when I got back, they gave me a job for the summer. You know what the job was? I was a janitor at the church for an entire summer. My job was to clean the toilet of the pastor every day, to clean the toilet of the pastor. And it just clean, like, like, and then I remember one time I snuck up behind the pulpit when everyone was gone and I started preaching, like pretending I was preaching. And my boss walks in the room and he's like, get off there. All right, and I'm like, man, eh, I'm sorry. He's like, that's the sacred pulpit, bro. Get off there. What, you, you, you'll never do that with your life. Who do you think you are? And you know what the thing was, man, that summer was all about grind Finding me down and whoever I thought I was. See, humility is the only way toward clarity. When it comes to your faith, when it comes to understanding God, you got to get out of the way. You got to understand what he's done for you. It's the only way to see him clearly. Now, humble, 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 humble. I'm not worthy. Here's a flip side. Just before you get too humble and too, uh, you know, I'm a worm theology. I want to flip it and say something else though. At the same time, John the Baptist did some stuff in his life that was incredible, and so can you. He didn't sit around. He, go, he didn't go, I'm not worthy. I'm just going to sit at home and be not worthy. He goes, let me be on mission in my life to do some great stuff. As one, uh, John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11, you know, Jesus Christ calls him the greatest human being who ever lived. Isn't that incredible? The guy who's saying, I'm not worthy. Those two things, hold up, you ready? Are connected. You start out with, I'm not worthy. You start out with, I'm, I'm, I'm a voice. And you become greater. It's what leads to it. It's, I was reading one writer this week. He said, if the first peril of Christians is to think too much of themselves, which is what we just talked about, the second peril is to think too little of ourselves that we don't do anything. See, we are uh, sent as testifying to the light. We're not the light, but we're lights. Don't sit around and do nothing with your life because you think you can't do some stuff. You are the light on the hill. Remember Matthew chapter five? You're a light on a hill. Don't put it under, right? Put it under the bushel. Put, no, all right? Remember that song? <laughs> right? that's, that's the idea. I don't want you under a bushel doing nothing, sitting around feeling bad about yourself. I've empowered you through myself and the Holy Spirit's work in your life to, to, uh, to start with a place of unworthiness, but then you, you hear my declaration on your identity and then you are empowered and animated to accomplish great things for the sake of the kingdom. What great things are those and how do they look? There's a certain kind of discipleship that John the Baptist personifies. He's this beautiful, unreal example of discipleship in our life. And the thing I want to extract from it is he's the undomesticated one, right? He's the adventurous one. He's the wild one. He's the one that makes you question whether faith is supposed to look this clean in your life. Some of you are watching this and you are bored with Christianity. You know why? Because you're not following Jesus the way John the Baptist did. He was jacked up. We come to church and we're in our nice church clothes and we drive up in our SUVs while the cleaning lady's cleaning the house so we could come back and have a perfect little. John the Baptist took a Nazarite vow, okay, which means he ate wild honey uh, and, and, and he, would, he was dressed in these weird clothes and he would literally, he, uh, the, the way that they tell us through history, he would have had his hair in six or seven long dreadlocks that went down his back. He never would have cut his beard and he would have wrapped it around himself in a sack. All right? This is the guy you don't take home to your parents guy. All right? That's this guy. 
I remember when I first, when Erin invited me to her place for the first time to eat dinner with her parents, I was like this guy, I was like the guy, I didn't even know, like we sat down for dinner and these are like, you know, church people. And I'm sitting there, I'm not even talking to them. I'm like, just eating. I'm like, I'm here to, I'm here to date your daughter. I'm not dating you. All right. That was my whole mentality. I was a wild man. Right. And there's a piece of that that John the Baptist is going, that's exactly how your Christian life is supposed to be personified. The radical discipleship, not the safe discipleship. One writer has put it this way. Christianity over the last 2000 years has moved from a tribe of renegades to a religion of conformists. It's safe for the whole family. And yet you hear the words of, of Rocky, you know, his trainer, when he looks at Rocky and he goes, the worst thing has happened to you that can happen to any fighter, Rock. <laughs> you got civilized. You got civilized. Many of you, your Christianity has gotten civilized. It's boring. There's no risk. There's no adventure. You should be rattled by Jesus Christ. Rattled because he wants to come after your money, your sex life, how you work, how you do friendship, how you do singleness, how you're a teenager, how you're a young adult, how you're a grandparent. You know, you want to stop to think about it, like grandparents sin. Isn't that weird? I remember listening to the testimony of a, of a guy, um, his name's um, Gordon McDonald and he's in his 80s. And he was on a podcast with my friend, friend Carrie Newhoff and, and, and Carrie said, what, do you, what, do you, what are you feeling right now that you need to say to the church? And he's like, you know, there's this whole generation of people my age. You ever wonder what our sins are? Because we know the sins of young people. They're, they're you know, going to testosterone and everything's, ee, you know, we know it's like sexual sin and we know there's stuff. You ever wonder what the, the sin of an old person is? You ever wonder what the sin of me, I'm 85, you know what it is? I could just retire from mission, from faith, from adventure. What if you, what if you just let me do that as my pastor? You would fail me, man. And I think some of you have arrived at that before it's even your time. We're supposed to die with our boots on. If you're older, you mentor, you pour in, you use your resources. You never, you, you don't just retire. We need elders at the gate. We need people on mission, on fire. This is what, and I just wonder if we have this whole generation of you know, safe, and it's because we've, we've done well. It's the grave digger effect. We've done well financially. We've done well in life. We have a running water and a beautiful house and a good job. And that kind of just, it, it takes the risk away because we're not hungry. We don't have to grind. So I drove past, uh, I live in this near an elementary school. And yesterday, or a couple of days ago, I was driving uh, to the store in the morning and every, the, all the streets were rammed with all these cars. And it was because all these parents had come to drop off and, and, and pick up every day. My whole street just gets rammed with cars dropping off and picking up, dropping off and picking up. Pick. And I drove past and I went, my gosh, these kids are just going to be spoiled brats. Who gets picked up and dropped off in their perfect, when I was a kid, I had to walk. To school. You know how many times my parents picked me up from school? And how many times did they drop you? And and I grew up in Toronto. It's like 300 below zero. I had to walk uphill both ways, snow up to my eyeballs. You're walking. I got a job. I got stuff to do, kid. Figure it out. I'd be walking only pitch dark after playing, you know, in the winter. It's now four o'clock. It's been I'd be like, what's going on? I got to fight my way through the forest. Parents didn't care. And that built character. I mean, this is what I'm saying. We become so, listen, parents, when your kids ask you if there's monsters, don't lie to them and tell them there aren't. You have a job. You have a requirement to tell them that there are. It's just, we follow Jesus, the one who destroys all the fear. 
that the monsters bring into our life. J Satan, sin, death, these are real things. I tell, my, I tell you guys this all the time. Satan, what does Jesus say? Satan was a liar, a thief, and a murderer from the beginning. You know what that means? He wants to kill you and kill your family and kill the leaders of our church, kill your pastors of your sites. He wants to destroy us. But we, fought, we don't fear because we follow the one who is more powerful than anything that is in this world. He that is in you is greater than he that is in this world. This is the central reality that we follow in the midst of anxiety. John the Baptist knew this was a war. And if you haven't woken up to that fact, take his life and let it inspire you. This is why the apostle Paul says, you want images for the Christian life? Athlete, farmer, soldier, because we're in the midst of a war. I was reading this book the other day called The Decadent Society. And it's basically about the fact that we've done so well in the West. One of the chapters is called Stagnation. What it means is we've done so west, we've done so well, we've dug ourselves a grave in the west where we're stagnating. We don't even, we, and he makes this point. This is fascinating. He says, outside of the internet, we have not invented anything worth talking about since the 1950s as a culture. And, and he does this thought experiment. He says, okay, you can do one of two things if you doubt that, because obviously, you know, if you were born in the 90s or whatever, the 80s, you might think, oh no, they, all the great things are now. Those people back then, they didn't know anything. Ask yourself, he says, do this thought experiment. You can take any invention, one of two things. You can take all the inventions before the year 2000, or you can take everything after 2000. Which would you take? Yep, you can get your phone. I mean, not really anything to do with it because the internet doesn't get, it gets invented before the year 2000. But you can have your phone, you know, that was 2006. What have we done? Nothing of interest because we're not hungry. Hunger creates innovation and it's true about us spiritually. We don't, we don't, you know, in a different passage, when Jesus is talking about John, he talks about people who get into the kingdom violently. And, and it's a Greek word that, that talks about with aggression. John the Baptist was a guy who went after his sin aggressively, who wanted to get into the kingdom. He was violent for holiness. He was violent after godliness. He, he wanted to do what God wanted him to do at any cost he went in for adventure, not safe for the whole family. I love this passage in Matthew chapter 11. Listen, uh, verse seven, they went away and Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? He said, a reed shaken by the wind. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. What do you think this is? Soft clothing time? What, what, what do you think, a reed just blowing in the wind? Is that you? Just blown around by every wave of false teaching and every new idea that comes about in the culture and you're so weak and shallow that you're not strong in faith, so much so that could even lead to what we see it lead to in his life. Look at verse seven. He came as a witness. You see that word witness? You know what the, uh, the um, Greek word there for in, in witness is the word murderos, murderos. It's where we get the word martyr. John the Baptist, you know where he go, ends up in his life? The, the story is told in Matthew chapter 11. He, he ends up in jail and he says, is Jesus, gonna, is Jesus the one I should follow or not? And then there's this great passage where, where Jesus says, tell John, and he starts citing Isaiah 35. Tell John that the blind see and the lame walk and the deaf hear. And, and he starts going through this passage from Isaiah 35, which John the Baptist would have known off by heart. It's one of the great messianic expectation passages. And what he's trying to say is the time has arrived. I'm the one. 
But then right at that passage in, in, in Isaiah 35 where, where it says, and the prisoners should be set free. Jesus, go read Matthew 11. It's beautiful. Jesus deletes that part. And he says, let him be blessed who is not offended by me. What? So John's sitting there waiting. He's going, oh, I know, I know where this is going. The blind see, the deaf, oh, the prisoners are going to be set free. And Jesus goes, oh, and don't be offended by me. Meaning what? And here's the theology that, I know isn't lovely for us and it blows our minds in modern, safe, conservative Christianity, but Jesus is saying, I'm not coming for you, John. It is my will that you die. That you get killed for this. And there's gonna be millions after you. Go read Revelation 12. He doesn't come back until the full number of those who are gonna die because the testimony of Jesus has reached its number. If your kid came to you, if my daughter, one of my daughters came to me and said, I want to be a missionary in Iran and I might die for it, what would I do? But it's going to affect Christmas dinner. I want my girls close to me. Yeah, I do. But I've tried to spend my life showing them there's more important things. Is this why Jesus calls him the greatest person who ever lived. And the, other, the other meaning of witness is that he's literally like, like the gospel of John is so beautiful because it's set up um, very much like, like the gospel of John, his um, trial narrative of Jesus, like at the end before he gets crucified is, is, is shorter and, and more succinct than the other three gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke is this long trial John's is shorter. And scholars point out the reason for that is, is because in a sense, the whole gospel of John is one big trial. And what John does is he calls witnesses throughout his book. And this is the first mention of the first witness. So do you like courtroom dramas? Like, like have you ever seen like a, like a few good men? Like you can't handle the truth. Right, Jack Nick, you do not sleep under the blanket of freedom and which I provide and then question the means in which I provide it. Right? Or law some of you are Law and Order fans. Right? I remember Law and Order. So good. It's like <laughs> this idea that gets into our minds about watching in a one hour drama someone does something and then the cops get them and put them in a trial and then a trial happens and then it's done and we know and we can wash our hands of it and move on but this trial is going to go longer and they're going to have to call witnesses and they're going to these witnesses are going to testify to the claim of the first five verses is this human being actually God now what is he wit- witnessing to? What is he testifying to? What is the end goal of a witness? Because there's always an end goal. I, I uh, was called in on a trial one time and as a witness and I had to work with the lawyer and you always have an end goal of why, what your testimony is gonna do. It has one point to it and we gotta keep pounding that point. So what is he actually, actually witnessing about? It says, to testify concerning that light so that through him, meaning John the Baptist, all might believe. That's what his life is about. I'm going to live a life sold out to the question of whether you believe. That's John the Baptist. That's the gospel of John. His whole purpose, his thesis statement in chapter 20 is, the reason I'm writing this book is so that you might believe Jesus is the son of God. The reason I'm a pastor, all right, the reason I I sat in libraries for six years of my life and studied Greek for three years and do your weddings and your funerals and long after my kids are in bed, sit around and read commentaries to preach sermons and shepherd and lead and come up with strategies about how to reach. What's the point of all of this? Why do I do it? For the same motive that John the Baptist lived so that you'll believe, that's it. And some of you haven't yet. And the thing that kills me, the thing that keeps me awake at night are, 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 are not just the people who are part of our church. The thousands of you who call Village home and, and the thousands of you that have 
called Village Home since we've gone online from all around the world, which is crazy. Guys, there's an amazing move of the Spirit taking place right in this moment. There's groups of people coming to believe in this moment because everyone we want to reach is online. And many of you have raised your hands. You've started giving. You've started being a community group. You've started taking Alpha or Freedom Session or serving it or whatever it is. And you're in different states and different countries. It's incredible. This is the whole village family now of people who are coming to believe. People send me emails and stories about, I didn't believe and then I watch online and now I believe and can I get more resources? Can I get more disciples? This is happening all over the place. This is why I get up in the morning and what bothers me are the people who don't believe. That's what, when I drive home from the office, it's all the people that I drive past who aren't a part of our church, who don't know Jesus yet, that keep me awake at night. See, this is a point. I want you to believe, but see, even believe is kind of a, of a spiritual buzzword to modern people, because what does it mean to believe? We're just kind of happy when I talk to people at coffee shops, like, well, I'm happy you believe, you believe, you believe something. It's important to believe something. But the problem in the modern kind of postmodern culture is what it means to believe is just to believe in belief. That's like good enough, right? I, I saw this clip from Oprah where she's sitting there interviewing someone who's an atheist and she, she's like, well, when I go out into the ocean, I look at the ocean and I, I feel something's behind the veil or whatever. And Oprah's like, see, you're not an atheist because you believe in the energy of the ocean. That, that's, your, that's God then. And it's like, gee, John's going, eh. It's not just to believe in general, it's to believe that Jesus is the Christ, is the son of God, is the one who actually came to save you. It's, it's not a generic belief, it's a specific belief because in the end, there are two kinds of people in this text and you're one of them. He was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light, to the true light that gives light to everyone who's coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Here's the first group of people. John's desire is that everyone would believe. There's a first group of people divine by unbelief. They do not recognize him. He came to that which was his own. This is a fascinating phrase. Um, into his own house. It literally in, into, his, into one's own things is literally what the Greek man it meant. Um, it's actually... The only other time in the gospel of John it's used is when Jesus is on the cross and he looks down to the writer John and he says, you will now take my mother Mary into your own things, um, into your house, into your life. And he says, there's this group of people um, who, who, who look at Jesus and they, they don't do that, but they, but they were his own. This was Israel. This was the Jews. He, he, didn't just, he didn't just like, this is the tragedy of the story. He didn't just like show up to the world generally, like be dropped down into, you know, India or something or China and start walking around going, hey, I'm Jesus. Anybody want to believe? He came to his own. Israel, the Jews in the first century. His, the people he got through the Passover, the people he, he saved in Exodus and saved in, in, in the Babylonian exile and the Psalms were written to and the prophets preached about, it's all of them. It's like me coming home from work. I understand, listen, I understand. If I show up at your house and we don't know each other and I knock on the door and you look out and you don't let me in, especially with this mustache, I get it. You're like, who's creepy boy? What's going on? You know, no pervs allowed. I get it, all right? But if I come to my house and I pull up and I've left my house keys and I look at my kids look out the window and I'm like, and they go and they run away, something's wrong. That's a tragedy. My own family doesn't want me in the house. This is what's under John's writing here. He came to his own, like feel the burden and the weight and his own didn't receive him. They don't want what he has to offer and what ends up happening is they don't get eternal life. The joy, the peace, the truly human existence that he offers them. No, no, maybe that's you, right? Maybe uh, outside of just the Jewish culture, now us, we're made by Jesus and he shows up and he speaks to you and you don't receive him. You reject him. You decide not to actually believe in him. Why? Why do you choose not to believe in him? You've got to ask yourself the question. You've got you've to doubt your own doubts at times. Jesus tells us why. It's not because, is it because you're smarter than everybody else? 
Is it because you're cooler than everybody else? Is it because you know something we don't know? No, Jesus tells us why. In chapter three, the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light. The reason you haven't believed is because you want to hide. You love the darkness. You want to be your own authority. You want to run your own life. And my hope and prayer is that the spirit of God would just blaze through that kind of fogginess and get you to believe as John is pleading and saying, my whole book, my whole ministry, my whole life is about you believing in Christ. And then he says, there's another group of people who do believe. Verse 12, yet to all who did receive, this is, um, this word receive is great. To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This word received is, is more, it's, it's, it's the Greek word lambano, um, and it means to like, uh, to, to, to grasp, to, to obtain. It's like going after the, you know, the Holy Grail in, uh, in Indiana Jones or something. And, and, he, and he grasps, you know, the opening scene, that thing off the thing. And he runs away. And the, he, he, you, you, you receive it, you obtain it, you hold it tightly. That's the idea. It's not just, it, it blows away this kind of summer camp philosophy of you just believed a couple things and then you move on with your life. It's like, no, no, to, to, to receive it though. It's not believing some doctrine or voting certain way politically and that makes you a Christian. That gives you eternal life. It's, it's to receive it, to obtain it, to grasp it, to treasure it above every other thing in the universe. See, that's why receive and believe are connected, but they're different. It's not just good enough to believe. It's to cherish it, love it, him, more than anything, it's, it's, like, it's like me, listen, it's like me, my kids just started doing um, kickboxing. So I go to, before COVID shutdowns, they would go to the kickboxing thing and they'd be there and, they, and their sensei was like, whoa, 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 and they go, whoosh, whoosh, all three of my girls, punching, kicking, legit. And I would get there and all the parents would be there and they'd say, daddy, you embarrass us when you come. And I'm like, why? What are you talking about? Now, now I reflect back. I know why. Because every other parent's sitting there quiet. And I say, I believe in you. <laughs> hey, Bella, I believe in you. And she'd look at me like, shut up or I'll kung fu your fate. Like, what are you saying you believe? Now, what am I saying? That I believe she exists? That I think she had a historical reference point and maybe she did some stuff. No, I believe in you. Like I, like I, I love you. I, ch- I believe in what you're doing and what you've done and who you are. And I want to, I want to cherish and obtain and grasp. This is what I believe in you is more than uh, intellectual assent to a thing. It's, it's to love it and to cherish. This is what saving faith is. And if you think it's easy believism, recognize the context of what he's just said. It's John the Baptist's life who gives his life as a martyr. That's what it is to believe. Would you go that far? It's like Mary, it's not going forward one time. Picture your relationship with Jesus Christ as, a, as your marriage. You don't get to walk up to the altar one time and get married and never see, talk, or look at your wife again. Daily, your feet hit the floor and go, now, I want to follow. Now I want to be faithful to the covenant. Now I want to help her flourish. Now I want to serve her. Now I want to raise my kids well. Now I want to make money to make this family. This is, this is the daily. That's what it means to receive and obtain, to treasure, to cherish, to love more than anything, to take on the responsibilities. Today I'm going to follow him and tomorrow I'm going to follow him and the next day I'm going to follow him. That's what it is. This is who he's talking about. Then you become the children of God, this is the great image. We get adopted into a family. You get a new family. And you get the benefits of that family. You know anybody who's adopted? You know what they don't get is just a certificate that says you're in the family now and then everyone moves on with their life. What they do is they get a a place at the dinner table. They get a bed, they get hugged, they get loved, they get affirmed. Some of you are dying for this, but this is what the gospel offers you. 
an affirmation that some of you feel unworthy to hold on to. You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Well done, good and faithful servant. For God so loved you that he sent his only son. Go back to the verse. He sent John to testify to the light. He sent his son who is the light to come and die for your sin, rise again for your salvation. He sent, he loves, he pursues. He's willing to make you a child of God. Welcome to the table. My hope, honestly, is that some of you who are in the first category, people who don't believe, heart, your hearts would melt in the offer of family. And you would recognize this God is so good. And he saves you in such a way that, that, that this grasping is eternal. You can't, you can't fall out of it just because you mess up. That's what it be. My kids mess up all the time. I don't kick them out of my family. Sorry, Bella, you raised your voice. You, your bags are packed. You out. Dada. Nope. Not my kid anymore. No, you're my kid. You just need some discipline. See, if you could lose your salvation, you would. Let me end by reading you a quote from the 1500s, something called the Heidelberg Catechism. We don't talk about it too much in Protestant churches, but it's a beautiful thing that captures exactly this. The question in the catechism is this, how are you righteous before God? How would you ever attain righteousness before God? How would you ever get into the family of God? How do you become his child ever? Be forgiven now and go to heaven when you die. How would that ever take place? And the Heidelberg Catechism says this, and I'll leave you with it. Only by true faith in Jesus Christ, that is, although my conscience accuse me, that I have grievously sinned against all the commandments of God and have never kept any of them and am still prone always to all evil. Yet God, without any merit of mine, of mere grace, grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ as if I had never committed nor had any sin and had myself accomplished all the obedience which Christ has fulfilled for me, if only I accept such benefit with a believing heart. God, let those words change the stubborn hearts that are watching this. It almost actually makes me tear up this line as if I had never committed nor had any sin. The fact that you promise to remove sin as far as the east is from the west is mind boggling. Let it stir us up to holiness and obedience. Let us be half the people John the Baptist was. Let us live a life of discipleship as one writer has said, on the edge versus in the comfortable places. Change us, let us worship you in response to what you have done for us. Offering this kind of forgiveness and family, if we will grasp, treasure it at the core of our being, do that miracle among us and let us celebrate at the stories. In Jesus' great name we pray, amen.